Emily, and those of you that know me or who have ever watched a movie with me, you know that I am not um, a person that particularly likes the fantasy genre. I'm not a person that really copes with battle scenes or swords. Um, I end up only seeing half the film because the other half of it I'm hiding behind my cushion. But this one, even though it's a little bit fantasy and it definitely has some battle scenes and it has a bunch of swords, but it's a cartoon. So I did catch most of it. Um, I only missed a little bit behind my cushion. So um, we're going to be looking at the movie How to Train Your Dragon, and you just met Hiccup. And I think I've got a picture of Hiccup on the screens for you. He's the central character of the movie, and if you had to sum up this movie, I would say that it is the story of Hiccup as he defies tradition and he befriends one of his deadliest foes, a dragon that he calls Toothless, and then together, these unlikely heroes, they have to fight against all of the odds to save both of their worlds. Doesn't that sound amazing? It actually is a really good movie, and if you haven't seen it, I would totally recommend it. Hiccup's world is not ideal. He just, uh, well, you just saw it in the clip. He describes it as being on the, um, the meridian of misery. I thought, oh my goodness, no thank you. <laughs> it's not a it is not a nice place, and for generations and generations, the Vikings have been dealing, um, living in darkness and dealing with these pests called dragons, constantly coming in to steal their livestock, and in, so, in doing so, they continually destroy the village. The town is in darkness, there is no life, there's just hopelessness, misery, and brokenness. And I don't know about you too, but sometimes I feel like our world can feel a little bit the same. Sometimes it might feel like your world is actually built on the meridian of misery. And I don't know about you, but I only have to scroll through my Facebook feed. I only have to connect with some friends during the week to see just how broken the world is. And even just this week, I caught up with some really good friends and we just chat and we talk about life and fill each other in on what's going on in our worlds. And, and even just in this couple of hours as we caught up, I heard about um, the pain and the hurt of betrayal in a relationship. I heard about the, the sting of ongoing sickness and the financial effect that that was having on another marriage. And I, they talked about conflict and bitterness in the workplace. And I wonder if anyone here can relate to that. And I'm assuming that the same as me, you don't have to look far either to see the effects of brokenness in your world. Maybe it's your own home, maybe it's your neighborhood, maybe it's your workplace. You see brokenness and sickness and pain and suffering and selfishness. And we're all familiar with brokenness because it's real and it hurts and it affects each and every one of us. And much like Hiccup's Viking family, I find that as a society and as people, we tend to try and fix brokenness and escape the brokenness the same way that Hiccup's village did. We keep trying to do the same things and expect different results. You know, um, many of the people that I talk to are looking for an escape out of brokenness and they look to things like religion, trying to be a good person, Sometimes it might be looking to things like alcohol or drugs or relationships. Sometimes it's education, you know, trying to find success. But all of these things, they can never ultimately pull us out of the grasp of brokenness in our lives. But God has something to say about this. And, you know, as you read through the Gospels, one of the central messages of Jesus was that of the kingdom of heaven. You know, and I believe that as followers of Jesus, we bring the culture of the kingdom of heaven here to earth. We're advancing his kingdom. How do we do that? Well, we do it as we love and serve others out of our love for God. You know, we do it as we live counterculture. We do it as we live on mission, telling our neighbors about the one escape from brokenness that there is, and that is in the person of Jesus Christ. No, we live and we bring those things that are a part of the culture of kingdom of heaven. Things like love and joy and peace and patience and goodness and kindness and gentleness and self-control. Things like, like praise and vibrancy and life. 
Those are the things that we can bring, parts of the culture of the kingdom of heaven we bring here to earth. And we wake every single morning and we partner with the Holy Spirit, choosing to live as God's ambassador and share the gospel and extend the kingdom of light, extend the kingdom of heaven, whilst at the same time seeing the kingdom of darkness diminish. And that is an awesome life to live. And the thing is, we only have a limited time to do it in. We only have here and now in this lifetime. And as Christ followers, we need to make the world a better place. That's what Hiccup did. He changed his world. How did he do it? Well, what I want to explore this morning is that he went on a painful journey of discovering who he was not so that he could discover who he really was. And then in that understanding, understanding who he was not and who he was, he becomes an incredible blessing to the people around him. And he changed his word, world. And this morning what I wanna to suggest to you is that you and I, we can be a little bit like Hiccup. Maybe not in looks, <laughs> but in what he did. Because knowing who you are not frees you up to be who you really are. And I believe that each and every one of us can change the world that we live in if we are prepared to figure out who we are not and walk in the freedom of who we really are. And sometimes it might seem a little bit backwards to talk about figuring out who you are not, but I think that you have to get that bit sorted before you can actually walk into the freedom of who you are. So this morning I wanna tell you that you are not who others say you are, and you are not who they say you should be. Hiccup is desperate to kill dragons. He, society, tradition, the whole of his village and the people there tell him that it only it is a dragon killer who has made it. And so he thinks that, you know, it's not until he makes his first kill, until he brings his first dragon down, that he will be accepted, that he will be popular, that he will have success, that he will get his first girlfriend, that his life will be better. And so he spends his life wishing and hoping and dreaming and longing for the day that he is going to kill a dragon. The problem is that unlike the big muscly heroes that are out there killing the dragons, he doesn't really have the the skill and the size of a dragon killer. And it's particularly difficult for him because the leader of the village also happens to be his dad. So let's have a look at this clip as we watch Hiccup trying to be something that he just simply is not. So in the eyes of the villagers and even in the eyes of his own father, Hiccup is a disappointment because he can't kill dragons. He's just not built for it. We have to realize though that we don't have to be what the world defines as successful. We don't have to be what society or what culture or what tradition or even what your family and friends says defines success, even if they are well-meaning. And rather than being desperate to fit into what, you know, society says is the norm, we should just stand out. We should just stand out. One of the the values here at our church is counter culture. And in Romans 12 too, it says, do not conform any longer to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. You know, we should look, we should feel, we should smell, we should taste different to the rest of the world because we don't conform to its pattern. We're in the world, but we are not of it. We need to stop living for the approval of others We need to be stopped um, being bound by the expectation of others, whoever they might be, your boss, your colleagues, you know, your family, strangers that sometimes you don't even know, people that you see on social media. We need to stop living for those people and just start living for him. And we need to be intentional about it. You know, maybe you could actually ask God in your quiet time, in those times when we still, like Pastor Kev was talking about this morning, in the stillness of our hearts, you know, actually ask God to reveal the motives for why you wanna be the person that you think that you wanna be. Look at your giftings. Understand your limitations. You know, when you operate outside of your giftedness, you end up exhausted and you end up hurt, and so do other people. It's like when you often watch somebody singing on one of those reality TV shows. Everybody hurts, you're just like, you're not a singer, let's move on. Imagine if you actually spent 
the time that you put into improving your weaknesses. Imagine if you put that into improving or developing the skills and the natural abilities that God has already given you. Imagine what kind of impact you could have then. Let's have a look at this next clip when Hiccup encounters the dragon and he, he, you know, he thought he brought one down and so he goes in, he finds the dragon and he goes in for the kill. So in his journey of discovery, Hiccup discovers something really life-changing. He discovers who he is not. And despite the world around him telling that success can only be found when you kill a dragon, he realises that not only he can't do it, but that he won't. It's just not in him. He is not a dragon slayer. And maybe this morning you are not a dragon slayer. And what I want to tell you is that that is okay. Because in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 27, we read, But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise, and God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. The message version puts it this way. It says that God chooses men and women who culture overlooks. I love how time and time again, in both the Old and the New Covenant, we read stories about people that God has chosen uh, for incredible adventures in faith, but they're a little bit unlikely. Um, There was Rahab. You're familiar with Rahab, the story of the prostitute who lived in the city of Jericho. She took a chance. She hid some Israelite spies in her house that was built in the, um, in the wall of the city. She let them escape through the window down a rope and she basically was part of um, destroying that city and taking it over for the Israelites. Because of her actions, Rahab not only saved the lives of her family, but she ends up in Jesus's genealogy. And not only that, but in the New Testament, she is actually listed as an example of what it means to live by faith. Rahab the prostitute. What about King David? before he was king, he didn't even get a look in when Samuel the prophet came to anoint the next king. They'd lined up all of his brothers, they were all tall and good looking and muscly and whatever, and um, they were the likely candidates. And as Samuel went through each and every one of them, he's like, no, no, no. He turns to the dad, is this it? Is this all of your kids? And the dad's like, oh, there is one other brother, but he's out in the field caring for the sheep, surely you couldn't mean him. Like he was completely overlooked. He wouldn't even be considered. What about the disciples? Jesus chose fishermen and tax collectors. And sometimes I even think about Jesus himself. You know, how many people in that time overlooked Jesus as the Messiah because he didn't fit what the world thought a Messiah and a king should look like? Look around here this morning. You don't have to be a dragon slayer to make a difference in the world. Ordinary folk can be used to make a difference and to change the world. You don't have to be bound by expectation. You don't have to be bound by tradition. You don't have to do things the way that it has always been done. You are not who others say you are, and you are not who they say you should be. And when you figure out who you are not, you step into the most incredible freedom as you get to be the person that you were meant to be. You are set free. You're set free to see the world differently, to have your eyes opened to a different way of doing things and approaching things, to the possibility of different solutions for the world. You're free to walk, not bound by the labels that other people have placed on you, and not even bound by the labels that you have placed on yourself, but you instead get to walk in freedom and on purpose. And the voice that speaks truth into your heart is not the voice in the back of your head. It's not the voice of doubt, and it's not the voice of what other people say, because you're seeking the opinion of the audience of one, the only one that matters. And the devil might whisper in your ear who he thinks you are. And for me, that has looked like words like shy and clumsy and awkward and no confidence. And maybe for you, he's whispered words like slow, troublemaker, addict, short-fused, weak, a mistake. He might even try to remind you that you are what you've done in the past and that you're not forgiven or unforgivable. But that is not who you are. You are the person that Jesus Christ declared you to be when he willingly went to the cross and took your sin upon him. You are the son and the daughter of God. 
In Psalm 139, it says, For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. You are who God says you are, a masterpiece. Fearfully and wonderfully made. You are uniquely you. And you are created to be you. Your attributes, your makeup, your skills, your giftings, you are knit together by a loving God who loves you. And you'll never meet anybody else in this world who has your unique blend of heritage and of experience and of loves and dreams and yearnings. There is nothing ordinary about you. You're different, and some of you are a little bit more different than others, but there is nothing ordinary about you at all. You are God's masterpiece, and you were created for a purpose, to do what you were created to do. Ephesians 2.10, and it's a verse that many of us are familiar with. It says, for we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. And you know what stands out to me when I read that passage is that you do not need to do every single type of good work all of the time, everywhere. That would be impossible. But you were created to do the good works that God created you to do. His will for each and every one of us is that we would be holy like he is holy. And his call for each and every one of us is that we would follow him and that we would disciple others. But how that looks like, the, the, the expression of that in your life, that is unique. And that is, that is gonna shift and it's even gonna change in different seasons across your life. But the unique path that you are called to walk on is something that he has for you. And the stuff that you've gone through and the circumstances that you might currently be working through, the stuff that has shaped you into the person that you are today, the things that you love, the things that stir your heart and get you passionate and, and you know, get you off your seat and, and give you action, those are the things that he's gonna use in a really unique way to change the world that you live in. Because we are all full-time ministers and we happen to be disguised as business people and teachers and doctors and plumbers and mechanics and you know, whatever it looks like, it, it has a different expression. But we are all full-time ministers and we are made to make a difference and we're made to outlive our life here and now. We're made to make a mark on eternity. And all we have to do is step out in obedience and follow the prompting of the Holy Spirit and do the good works that he has planned in advance for us to do. Divine appointments specific to your circumstances, to your giftings, to what makes you you on the road that you are walking on, just like the Good Samaritan. You know, I read a, a book many years ago now um, by Bill Hybels, and it was called The Holy Discontent. And in it, he suggests that each and every one of us has a holy discontent. It's something deep within our souls that prompts us to take hold of a purpose. It asks the question that, you know, what part of this broken world, what part of, of the brokenness that we see around us when you touch it and feel it and when you get close to it, makes you just respond with, um, you know, it's not okay and I need to do something about this and it gets you off your seat and into action to get up and do something. That could be your holy discontent. But you have to encounter it and you have to touch it and you have to get up close and experience it because it's in that that it's gonna spur you on to do something. So um, have a look at Hiccup as he encounters and he spends time getting to know Toothless the dragon. His whole life, Hiccup has been told that given the chance, a dragon will go in for the kill. And he comes to the realization as he spends time with Toothless that everything that he's been taught is based on assumption. It's not truth. And he takes a risk. And it takes courage sometimes, doesn't it, to step out and engage in places that can sometimes make us feel a little bit uncomfortable. And it is a faith step because when he looks around his village, he sees most of the people there are missing a limb. <laughs> but he takes that step of courage anyway and he reaches out and he gets close enough to the problem to discover the truth. He realizes that there's another way, that there's another approach and that the solution might not be what has always been done. And from this point on in the movie, Hiccup is on a quest to discover more about the dragons and 
he does that in the hope that it'll lead to change. You could say that it's his holy discontent. It's wrong that they're killing the dragons and this is like a, a fire burning within him and he wants to be a part of the solution and he wants to be a part of the change. He has been looking at things he realises through his own eyes and his eyes have been shaped by the eyes of culture. They've been shaped by media through the eyes of his ancestor and through the books that they get him that says, you know, kill on sight, kill on sight. And I find that often when, you know, if we were to parallel that to our own lives, when we look through own, our own eyes, when we look through our eyes and they're shaped by the same things, culture and media and the way things that have always been done, our view is distorted and we don't see truth. We need to look through God's eyes because when you look through God's eyes, you see the world differently and you begin to see people the way that he sees them. When you view your world through his eyes, it does take courage and it causes you to ask the question, what would love require of me as I serve and love the people in his name? What would love require of me as I respond to this situation? Not out of law, what would love require to me in this situation as I respond not in self, not out of my own intellect or my own ideas or Ruth, but what would love require of me as I respond instead as Ruth who is slowly, hopefully, being transformed into the image of Christ as I spend time with him in his presence and as I you know, apply his word to my life and as I step out in joyful obedience of what I'm reading. Because when you look not through your own perspective, but through the eyes of God, he's gonna show you needs that you can meet. He's gonna show you hurts that you can help heal. He's gonna show you assumptions that you can help bring truth to. And with God's help and in his power, we can step out and we can intentionally um, engage. We can intentionally reach out and it's gonna take courage, but we can make a difference only when we do it God's way. There's more than one way to skin a cat, I've learned. It's a saying that I don't actually like and I don't understand. I should have Googled it to find out where it came from. I don't actually really like cats. I'm really allergic to them, but still, they shouldn't be skinned. So it's not a nice saying, um, but it is true. <laughs> there's more than one way to skin a cat and there's more than one way to deal with a problem. And the world would present us with its ways to deal with a problem and they can, can include control and manipulation and domination and power and self. But when we start to look at a problem through the eyes of our God, we see a different way to approach that problem. You have to look beyond the temporal and start to look with an eternity mindset. You have to see what other people do not see. What would love require of me? Understanding peace, discipline, joyful, servant-hearted obedience. Those are the things that we can approach problems with in a different way. So in the movie, Hiccup starts spending more and more time with Toothless and he learns through that relationship, through actually being there and spending time with him, what dragons are scared of, what foods they like, what foods they don't like. Um, and later on in the movie, you know, as he continues to find out more and more, he finds out there's a bigger problem than just the dragons coming in to steal their food. They're actually being controlled themselves. And he figures out that the different approach in this particular scenario is not killing a dragon, but training it. It would have a whole lot more benefits if they could just do that. And that's what happens when we look with eternal perspective, when we look uh, with God's eyes and we start to do things with his approach rather than ours. Romans 12, 21 says, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. God's way is different. God's way says love. Love God and love people. The two of those things cannot be separated. And so what I wanna ask you this morning is that, is there a problem that you are tired of everybody taking the same approach with? You know, maybe God wants to use you to bring around a solution that looks different, a way that will bring life. Don't allow tradition to blind you to fresh revelation. And ultimately, it's that thought that tradition doesn't have to um, blind you to fresh revelation that actually causes the, um, the realization in Hiccup that he can save his village a different way. So let's take a look. So he comes to the realization that he's the first Viking in 300 years to ride a dragon and it prompts him into action. He can do something that 
something that no one has ever done before. And it goes against tradition, but it works. And spoiler alert, if you haven't seen the movie, he and his friends ride in on dragons that they trained instead of killed, and they save the village, and all ends well. But you've got to do, yeah, sorry, sorry if you haven't watched it. <laughs> but you know it's going to end well for him, right? Yeah, he's the main character. You've got to do what you were created to do, but you've got to do it his way. So I want to encourage you to seek him, spend time not just reading scripture, but actually applying it to your life and being transformed. Ask him for wisdom and he will give you the plan, a different way. Uh, Colossians 3.12 is up on the screens and it shows you what this different way could look like. It's a way of love and a way of understanding. It's a way of compassion and kindness and humility and gentleness and patience, of forgiveness and of love. I believe that each and every one of us can change the world if we are prepared to figure out who we are not and walk into the freedom of who we really are. And my prayer this morning is that like Hiccup, we would step up and become heroes. Unlikely heroes, perhaps, but heroes nonetheless. And I'm a fairly positive person, and when I think about a prayer like that, you know, that we in this room would step up and we would go and change our world, I think about it in terms of what I read in scripture. You know, you read stories about when Jesus called the disciples, and it says that they pulled their boats up onto the shore and they left them there and they followed him. And that's what I imagine when I say, let's go and be world changers. But the reality is, you know, I do have rose colored glasses and I have a cup half full and maybe it doesn't look like that necessarily for all of us. It could, but maybe it doesn't. But my hope is that you would do something. Maybe you could consider this, this week one thing that you could do change something. Maybe you're not going to change your entire village like Hiccup did this week at least, but you, could you go and meet your neighbour? You know, could you make a step to forgive and to reconcile a relationship in your life that is broken? According to one definition I read, a hero is someone who does what he can. So my challenge to you this week is to do what you can. Seek him and do what you can, because if each and every one of us did that, this world would be a different place. It would look different. Imagine just for a minute what it would look like as the kingdom of darkness diminishes and the kingdom of light, the kingdom of God expands as you and I partner with the Holy Spirit and go and make a difference in this world. The film ends with Hiccup stepping outside of his house and seeing the dragons and the Vikings work together to rebuild the village. And I do, I just want you to see this last little clip, so let's play this one. So the village is alive with colour and laughter and light, and it's a better place. And I really love the line when the dad says to him, um, turns out all we needed was a little bit of this. And he's like, you gestured to all of me. Yep. Turns out in the same way, if we want to play our part in making the world a better place, it's going to require all of you being truly you. The you is you that you can be committing to go on the journey of discovering who you are not so that you can walk in the freedom of who you really are and whose you really are. As we partner with the Holy Spirit and we look and we approach the world with his eyes, with an eternal perspective, we can defy tradition we can defy what culture says, and we can change our world and make it a better place. I'm going to ask the stewards if you guys could please distributing the elements as we prepare to take communion together now as a family. You know, God calls each and every one of us to follow him, to lay down our lives as we surrender to the lifelong journey. It's not a short journey, it's a lifelong journey of being transformed into the image of Christ and being made holy as he is holy. And as we love him with all of our hearts and with all of our minds and with all of our soul and with all of our strength, the evidence of that love is in the way that we love other people. Love God, love people. The two of them cannot be pulled apart. They go hand in hand. And so what I want you to think about this morning as you just prepare to take communion together is the one thing that you could do. You know, maybe it's a friend or a family member and the thought of them going to a Christless eternity is just 
eating you up, then, then do something. You know, share your story, share the gospel with them. Is it the thought of kids growing up without role models, without someone that believes in them and encourages them and tells them that they can do something, you know, and make something of themselves? Well, then you can do something about it. You know, over the last season, we've been talking particularly about what this looks like as we move from a ministry mindset to a movement mindset. What does that look like? It looks like, you know, even our kids team, the kids themselves, and the families actually becoming part of ministering to the people outside of these walls. So that together we go on the journey of being conformed to the image of Christ and we start family discipleship before they even perhaps are sitting in these seats as part of our family gathering. But maybe that's the thing that God is gonna talk to you about. Maybe it's about a single mum who is adjusting to life as a parent and she's running on next to no sleep and she's got no one to turn to to help. Maybe it's the elderly, maybe it's the lonely, maybe it's a business leader. I don't know who it is, but I am confident that there is somebody on the path that you are walking on that God can call you to engage with, to lean in a little bit closer and to with courage reach out and be a part of the solution, to lean in, to love God and to love people. And as you really live, like really live as the youest version of you, you start to view the eyes, you start to view the world through His eyes, no longer distorted by self, but shaped by eternity. And you can step out in obedience and faithfulness as God uses you to reach out and to just be a part of bringing hope and joy and His love to the hurt and the brokenness of the people around us, to bring His gospel. Because change happens with the gospel when we present the good news. The power of the gospel is incredible. It is life changing, it is world changing. And we have the incredible privilege of getting to be a part of living and doing that. So that's my challenge this morning, empowered by the Holy Spirit, let's love like He loves. You know, let's step up. Like the disciples, we can leave our boat on the shore and choose to follow Him and do something through His power, be a part of seeing our city, our families, our nation, maybe even our whole world transformed. And as you prepare to take communion and remember what He did for us, the incredible sacrifice that He made for each and every one of us, just quiet your hearts quiet the the temple of your hearts like Pastor Kev talked about this morning and just allow him to speak to you. Maybe this morning he's going to remind you of who you are not. Maybe this morning he's going to remind you of who you are in him, whose you are. And maybe he's going to prompt you to just get out and do it, to take a step and to fulfill the purpose that He has for each and every one of you, but to do it not your way, but His. Let's eat and drink together. And as we do so, we'll remember His body that was broken for us and His blood that was shed for us. Let's do it in remembrance of Him. Thank you, Father God, for your incredible love. Oh God, I thank you for your amazing grace, a love so great that even when we were lost in sin and even when we didn't know you, you still knew us and you loved us and you sent your one and only son, Jesus, to die in our place and he took our punishment upon his body. I thank you, Lord, for your mercy and your grace and I thank you for your unfailing love and your forgiveness which has set us free. God, help us to walk in that freedom Oh God, may we live lives that honour you and glorify you. And God, it's my prayer this morning that you would remind us each and every day that we are not who others say we are or who they say we should be. But God, we are who you say that we are, that we are a masterpiece created in your image and created uniquely us. But even more than that, God, we are created with a purpose 
And I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would lead us into that purpose, even today, and that God, we would have the courage to ask the question, what would love require of me as we lean in and we obey you, as we serve and love people in your name because of the love that we have for you. And we thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen.